this is why it's really necessary to learn these technologies to really understand them. You know, if you really think that your livelihood is under attack, that's even more of a reason to understand, like, you know, why people are engaging with a piece of technology. Mm -hmm. um, that's even more important to really understand it, to really understand what's kind of going on. With social media and, like, I think generationally, sometimes the easy way to not deal with something is to not engage with it or to, like, kind of cancel it or to boycott it. And yeah. I think that's actually kind of removed a lot of opportunities. And it's also kind of even perpetuated, I think, like, the powerlessness a lot of people have. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of New Farm. I am super honored to have multidisciplinary extraordinaire Eric Hu on this episode of New Farm. Eric is a freelance creative director and art director of Eric Hu Studio, a creative consultancy and design practice based in New York. Previously, Eric Hu was a global design director at Nike on the sportswear brand design team and director of design at Essence. Hey, Eric, I'm super excited to have you on this episode of New Firm and super excited to talk to you about your life as a graphic designer and how you go into Web3 and also your views on communication as a concept and Web3 design. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I'm really excited to be here. You know, I think with, um, with all kind of emerging technologies, there always seems like this kind of panic rush to try to make sense of it. And so I think critical analysis is just like really important. You know, it's important to kind of just take a step back and just, just, you know, ask like kind of deeper and broader questions about what this means for, um, you know, artists and the livelihood of those, um, you know, creators, like whether, you know, there isn't necessarily, I think the right or kind of wrong answer to go about these things. It's just really about the act of just talking and understanding, I think the values of what people have and, and really kind of coordinate around people that kind of share those values. And so, yeah, this is something, you know, this is something that I wanted to be on and I definitely want to talk about, I think more and more. So just really excited to dive in um, and look, you know, to see what this kind of conversation brings. Thank you so much again. And Eric, you know, you have such an impressive background working with brands such as Nike, Essence, and as a co-creative director for Mold Magazine, a publication about the future and signs of food. This is all pretty mind-blowing. Uh, so can you tell our community about yourself and how your journey as a designer began? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. It's like when I look back, there's not necessarily like an exact moment where I could pinpoint like, look, I'm going to be a graphic designer. It, it was more kind of like a couple of different moments. Um, you know, I think when I was younger, before I even learned how to read, like I remember just doodling logos. I think just before I formed um, the ability to understand language, I think all around me were these like esoteric symbols in the environment. And, you know, even though I was like very like literally head empty at the time, I I think I took it in and it, it kind of brought up this like really kind of arcane feeling that, you know, these things like kind of meant something. So I think even early on, there was this kind of exposure. I think also growing up in an immigrant community, um, you know, growing around people like me and just seeing like storefronts and signs that didn't also have English. It was like, you know, restaurants that had both like English and Chi Latin and Chinese characters, or, you know, I got exposed to like, just, you know, like what letters in Thai looked like. Um, I think that was just really interesting. Like, and, and that kind of also exposed to me, like, you know, there's these like ways to just kind of transmit thought that different people have and but there is this kind of commonality and you can you know if you have some kind of core understanding with someone um, whether it's like your background or just your age or just your interests like there's just a way for i think two parties to you know really get to understand and really get to know each other i think what was also really cool is that you know my dad was a tinker you know he loved computers and i'm born in 89 so and i understand that this sounds like more of a banality than a novelty now but I got on the internet really early and so I was really exposed to websites really early and I always just kind of wondered like who kind of made them and so when I was 13 I just started really designing websites and going from there um, but it wasn't really like anything more than a glorified hobby until I was in high school where you know it was really time to just like choose like you know where do you want to study in school and what do you want to study and I thought I, you know, for most of high school, I thought I was just going to follow in my parents' footsteps, um, you know, just two kind of immigrants that had their own kind of small businesses. And I, 
I kind of just accepted that, but I think through this kind of like personal um, situation that I talk about kind of elsewhere, it was really this kind of moment of clarity where I was like, I really have to decide what I want to do. And, you know, am I going to be happy with that? And I, that was just kind of really when I realized that like, I've started a lot of hobbies. I started a lot of interests. I've also abandoned them. And, you know, by the time I was 18, I had just been doing design for, this was like the longest sustaining hobby that I, that I had that I wasn't like grossed out with. And so I was just, you know, it seemed kind of like a, a thing worth like kind of pursuing. And I am so glad I did. Um, I think just, you know, going to art school is just one of the best decisions of my life. It's not something that I say is necessary for people who are interested in design, but I just really, you know, it was just so kind of sectioned off in my head. Like this was just like something I did on the weekends and it really changed like when I went to school and this was like, this is like a calling that a lot of people have. This is a mindset, you know, even if you don't be, end up being a designer, it was very clear that like graphic design was this interesting lens that you could view the world in. It was this kind of gateway to kind of other things. And so, you know, really just kind of taking it from there. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just really wild. Like I, 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 this is not where I imagined I'd be when I was 13. And so, you know, I think there's, there's definitely a lot of things I would say to my younger self if we ever cross paths, you know, somehow. Eric, that's quite inspiring. You know, thanks for, for, for being all very thorough about um, sharing your background and experiences. And it's really impressive that when I look at like the schools you've even attended that you're associated with is, is very impressive in itself. Yeah. I'm curious to hear a bit more about that. Yeah. I, um, I have, I guess I have this like weird survivor kind of bias. Right. And so it's, it's really hard to kind of understand like the steps you kind of take, because I think when you succeed in something, like you only kind of know that path, like you don't really know what happens when you fail. So a lot of times when like people like are given like advice for people that did it, it's like, you know, through a really specific lens, right? It's like, you know, this worked for me because it, it worked, but you know, there's an alternate universe out there where I didn't get into art school and you know what I have that same advice. And it's like, I don't know. So I'm, I'm couching all of this where it's just like, you know, a lot of this was also just like privilege. A lot of this was like really luck. Um, you know, the fact that I had access to tools and to, you know, things that teach myself to prepare a portfolio to go to school. You know, I had a lot of classmates who also wanted the same thing in high school, but because of like their immigration status, because of like, you know, the lack of access that they had, a lot of them, you know, really couldn't pursue that dream because I think, you know, all school is expensive in the United States, but art school in particular is like really, really expensive. Um, and so I think navigating it, it was interesting too, where, um, I wasn't necessarily always the cultural fit. Like, um, you know, I was good at websites, but I wasn't really deep in kind of like that design kind of canon. And so when I got into art center for my undergrad, you know, it's a school with a very traditional kind of view. And like, I remember just like the first semester they, you know, you weren't, you aren't really touching the computer. It's a, it's a little bit different now because the program's kind of modernized a bit, but I was sort of like one of the last classes where, you know, your first semester is with like a paintbrush instead, and you're really learning like image fundamentals. And, you know, as somebody that is very terrible at drawing, I think this kind of reiterated like everything about like imposter syndrome ever. I was just like, I shouldn't be here. I'm a fraud. Like, you know, so that first semester was really hard. But then once it came time to just learn computers, it was like, you know, I, I just like rubbed my hands together and I was just like, I'm in. And so a lot of times it was just like, you know, I, I did have thoughts about dropping out that first semester because it was just like, I made such a huge stink. You know, my parents were, didn't approve of it. You know, I was just like, if I'm going to have to go on loans, I'm going to do it. Like, you know, I don't really need your support. And, you know, that first semester was really hard. I was like, am I just going to look really dumb? Am I just going to go back with my tail between my legs? And I think that's a lot of things too, or it's just like, sometimes it's not necessarily like, something you particularly do is just like how long do you hang on to something you know it's like more and more now it's like you know I have a, just like a lot of colleagues that were just had this like huge spark and like they were gonna go somewhere but you know for one reason or another they kind of like left the scene and they left the industry and there's other people that kind of just developed a lot more slowly you know they weren't seen as like particularly kind of outstanding but I think just because of the consistency of just hanging out around um, you know, they started to really kind of reap those benefits. And so I think there was that. And, you know, grad school was also this really interesting thing too, because, you know, my undergrad, 
it was a really technical school, but it really kind of like shunned theory and shunned like kind of academics where grad school is kind of the opposite. So I almost kind of felt myself like, you know, I clearly don't kind of fit in. Like, you know, I haven't read the things that my classmates have read. I, I feel kind of really kind of out of it. And I think like, you know, in terms of just like that brought out a lot of the insecurities. Mm -hmm. And I think for a while, like my first year, I, I really tried to just cosplay as like my classmates. And like, I really try to be interested in the things they interested in. And I think after like a really just unhappy first year, I just kind of said, fuck it. Like, I'm just going to do what I'm interested in. And I'm just going to own, I think, where I came from, where my background. And even if it's something that people couldn't necessarily digest um, because of just like my experiences, like a lot of my classmates just didn't have my background. And, right. you know, they came from kind of a more kind of traditional European, I think, training of art. Um, you know, there was just kind of moments where I did feel kind of like a fish out of water, but I think in the end, like just kind of just simply living something that was more truthfully to my own experiences. That was actually when I found, I think my own voice. And that's when I allowed myself to, I feel like come to like a language and a style that I, I could really call my own. And so, you know, school is, school is really interesting. I think now, like, you know, is university education important? Uh, you know, I don't know. Um, but I think what, what's really valuable, I think, is the environment that you put yourself in. I think most of my learning came outside of the classroom. And I think that would be the same thing. You know, I think a lot of people would say the same thing about that. And so when people ask me, it's like, is school necessary? It's like, I don't think you need to go through that kind of traditional route, but there's something to be said about being around a bunch of people who want the same thing that you do, you know? And like when you're in a room with them, magical things happen. And so, you know, if you don't want to, do that with a classroom, I think, you know, definitely try to recreate that with your group of friends, like, you know, like have a Zoom cohort where you could check in on, you know, and give feedback in this like kind of safe space. Um, because really, yeah, it's like it really, really wasn't about the school. It was about your schoolmates. It was about, it's about seeing other people work through what you're trying to work through and just getting that kind of diverse set of experiences and problems. And so now that I've been out of school for, um, you know, this is my 10th year out of school. Um, I do miss those conditions sometimes because I think when you're working, you don't really get in that kind of critique mindset. Like critique from a client is very different than critique from a peer. You know, the stakes are very different. And so you you miss out on certain conversations and whatnot. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. I, I What I get, I got from it is like to stay true to yourself and also uh, I guess I admire your tenacity and resilience, you know, because you touched a bit on how sometimes people kind of like give up along the way you know and you kept pushing and you found your 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 your, your place and that that gets me thinking about web3 and it always feels like web3 is like a perfect fit for you kind of maybe i'm wrong but i'm i'm curious to know your experience getting involved with with zara and friends with ben yeah. and you know how how did you go from being initially skeptical about crypto to becoming interested in these platforms and what kinds of opportunities have they like opened up for you as a creative professional? And I think that could also be connected to what you're talking about. Do we really even need to go to school these days? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I think to just even talk about like why web three is appealing to me at all. It's like kind of taking a step back to maybe the early days of the web where, um, you know, I was around for web one and, you know, there was a lot of, it was very rough around the edges. There's definitely a lot less you could do on the internet back then than you could do now. Right. But I think this is something really interesting where, you know, a stranger could put on a website and I could come across that website by a stranger and I would just be totally immersed in their world. You know, at the time it was, I guess, a Dragon Ball Z fan page or, or, you know, like Naruto facts. But I think it was, the, the effect is really the same where somebody could really build something that's just you know, a mixture of just like text, images, colors, like layouts. Um, and you would just really be sucked into their world. And I think the problem was, is just that, you know, back then it's like, you couldn't really make money on the web. So a lot of this was really kind of passionate. Um, and this was like things that people did in their free time. And now it's like the, the internet's very different. You know, there's a lot of money to be made on the internet, but it's not evenly distributed to, you know, everybody. It's like, it's really concentrated to like, you know, 1% of, you know, companies and, and people. And I think other things that happened too, were just like your canvas as like an artist or designer has shrank. Um, you know, gone are the days of like, 
like, you know, even like Tumblr accounts where, you know, it's, it's something that Tumblr was interesting where it's like, you have like the social fee, but you could also just build your own kind of shrine with the Tumblr. I think as things started moving away towards like, you know, these platforms that are kind of seamless, like Instagram, um, you lose a lot of context, you know, it's like, it, it's really hard. It's like, and now TikTok and I think effect of that is also just like the things that you actually make become less important. Like. A lot of times I, I was feeling like I was almost kind of moving into like, it, it's like in order for you to kind of make a living and have a sustainable living as like an artist or creator or designer on the web these days, it's almost like you have to have like a, a social media presence and you have to have a personality. And it's like you post your images on Instagram and you get these comments and you're kind of tethered by it. Like more and more I was realizing like, you know, I was being turned down for jobs with clients, not because of the work I was doing, but because I didn't have enough Instagram followers, you know, um, or, and it just becomes this kind of weird kind of thing where, you know, it's like, maybe when you, it's like, let's say if you're a musician, like you wanted to make like music and you wanted to make songs, like, you know, now if like a label's like telling musicians to do like these silly kind of TikTok dances, you know, to promote a song, it's like, is that what you wanted to do yeah. when you were younger? Right. And so it's like the things that we're making have less value in web two. And it's also just about like, we're all moving towards being like kind of performance artists. You know, it's like, you have to react to something and everything has to be memed. And this just kind of brought up a lot of just kind of distress. It's like for a long time, I kind of just accepted it. It's like, there's nothing you could really do. You know, it's like, I, I grew up like coding and I grew up making websites, but there was actually a few years where I just stopped because it was just like, I wanted to make websites, but I was, being kind of you're kind of being asked to make web apps now and it's like just kind of very different right and um i i had been friends with you know with trevor for a couple of years at that point now uh, trevor's the founder of fwb and we worked on a project together and i think we kept in touch but um when he started fwb i was kind of just confused what it was i was really kind of skeptical of crypto it just seemed kind of this wildly speculative kind of technology but i also remember like in 2015, I had a conversation to, you know, be a designer for this company. Um, it was called mine at the time, but now it's called media chain. And it was started by Jesse Walden. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the founders of that website mirror, um, you know, that web three kind of platform. Um, and they, this was back before Ethereum was created. This was, you know, this was, they were trying to do this on Bitcoin, but they wanted to create almost like a Shazam for images. And that's the best way to describe it because like they were noticing, you know, because of like mood board culture, like things on Pinterest and things were shared. It's like a lot of people weren't being credited, you know, it's like, and this is the thing about web two, right? It's like, you're, it's really this ratio between attention and like, you know, like the value you get from that attention. It's like, you have to get a lot of people's attention, but you're, by the time you do that, it's like the context is lost in your work that, you know, it's like people might not even know you're the one that created it. So you definitely don't see value of it. Um, you know, me and like a lot of my peers, like we would do work that we were really proud of, but it would end up on a mood board that, you know, an agency can use to sell our work to a client that they would never hire us for anyways. Um, and you kind of just accept these things, right? You're just like, that's just how things are. And they wanted to create this registry because it's like, if, you know, if you could use Bitcoin back then, they saw this as like, you can't change the ledger on Bitcoin. Um, and they're like, you know, what if we could kind of create like almost like a family tree of images? And what if we were really smart about it? You know, like they, they use the Mona Lisa as an example, which is really funny because the Mona Lisa is used as an example to explain web three a lot too. It's just like, you know, image recognition doesn't go all the way. It's like, you could have the Mona Lisa on a mug and you can have the Mona Lisa on the Louvre, you know, you as a human being, you understand the idea of the Mona Lisa. So you see how they're related, but you know, computer vision at the time, is just like, it didn't have those kind of relationships, right? Like, um, there's so many layers that go on and where it's like, okay, if somebody created like, um, a YouTube video that used like thriller or a cover of like Michael Jackson's thriller as a background music, can you really kind of trace it back to like Michael Jackson created this song? Um, you know, so there is this whole culture of YouTube of uploading, you know, background music, you know, this person made a cover of that Michael Jackson song. And then that person used that cover. Like, how do you really kind of trace the family tree of that? And that's what they were trying to do. And the technology was just kind of a long way to go. And it, it wasn't until like I had um, a meeting with um, D, the, the founder of, you know, one of the co-founders of Zora, um, that I really just remembered that 
time that, you know, Jesse Walden and them like reached out and talked about that Shazam for images. And that was what kind of was intriguing. And it was like, that's exactly the thing that they were talking about, but it wasn't possible before because Bitcoin, you know, as a network had its limitations, but yeah. Ethereum was this new thing that you could write programs on top of. So this was very trivial. And not only was it trivial, people already done it and it's called an NFT and, you know, it was like a 45 minute kind of zoom call that I felt like just changed like my trajectory for the entire year. I don't even understand like how I even got that in the first place. I think, you know, I think the co-founders had been aware of my work and they were also just aware of like my peers and they are also friends. And, you know, I think they also knew Trevor and I think they just messaged and were just like, Hey, I think you'd be really into this. And so they gave me a demo and a walkthrough of Zora and I was just really kind of blown away. And it's like, um, and it was just really weird from that to like forking my own smart contract like a few months later. And it was, what was really amazing was like, I had been, again, like I'd been out of the web, you know, I'd, I'd been tired of coding by then. It was so I didn't like the state of where the web was going. And so it was also just me to rediscovering just like my love for, you know, for coding and for programming and for web development and catching up on all the technologies that I missed. And so, yeah, I think that's definitely how I got into it, but yeah, it was really just like, just really being amazed at just the potential use cases where it's like, now there's an opportunity for us to just make things and just for have those things to just exist. And like, if Instagram, you know, went down, um, you know, I wouldn't have anything to really lose. And like, this is kind of like a thing where it's like, I think for me, I built a lot of my career by just being visible on Twitter. Um, and so I got to know a lot of people and got to spread a lot of awareness through my work on Twitter and Twitter is I think like my most active like social media and you know when the rumors were going around that twitter might shut down i think with you know after elon took over outwardly i was just sort of like just like whatever like maybe this is for the best like you know i'm getting tired of what like web 2 just has so much like twitter had just become not completely fun it was like you know people were just having like emotional kind of meltdowns and people were arguing over things and all that was doing was just increasing you know, like Twitter's valuation at the time. And I didn't really like that relationship, but when it almost, there was this one Friday where everybody was certain that Twitter was about to, you know, shut down. Yeah. And I had this kind of just, again, this other moment of clarity. It's just like, this is just really kind of awful. Like I, I have my whole, I have like a whole decade of my life on here. You know, this is how I met so many of my friends. I actually don't know what would be like a replacement for that. And it was really real then, but it was always a possibility back then. And and just knowing that, you know, this was Web3 was just almost like this way of like flipping that relationship where, you know, before like people build platforms and you build content on top. And now this is an opportunity for people to just build content and just have platforms, you know, are, you know, they're at the end of the stack, not at the beginning. Like it's like content that could just kind of go anywhere. You know, that was also really um, powerful. And the fact that like an NFT could be any file format, you know, it's like it could even be a website that really brought up a lot of things that I wanted to explore when I was younger. Like, um, you know, just for me in terms of design, like I, like you mentioned, I, I'm really interested in typography. And so I really love that tradition of lettering. And because of that, you know, I really love books. Like I'm an avid kind of book collector, but I also really love, um, you know, making websites at the same time. And there's just, ever since I was young, it was just very obvious. It was like, you know, when you hold a book in your hand, it just has this really different kind of quality. and can you, can a website ever make you feel that way? And so I remember in grad school, I was just trying to like find ways in which like, you know, one could make like generative art or like websites and have them feel kind of physical, but there was no kind of delivery mechanism or vehicle for that. You know, it's like, I tried making like web zines, like with, with like zip files, you know, that would give to somebody in a USB drive. And it always felt kind of jokey, but it was just like realizing like, wow, like, you know, when you look at something in your wallet, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, an NFT in your wallet, it does have this kind of, kind of physicality to it. And it does have this kind of feeling. Um, and it, it was just like, it's not completely there yet, but it's a lot closer to something that I imagined would be really interesting one day, you know? And it's like, can you make like a website that feels like a zine in your hands? And like NFTs just really felt like there's something interesting. And so I might be getting ahead of myself, but like, I think that's the thing that I've been working on in the background for the last couple of months too. It's like, um, you know, just using the advantage that like a website can be an NFT to create these little kind of zines and these booklets of illustrations and to just call it like a zine and just to market at that and trying to see if like, you know, I could start like a publishing company from that and whatnot. And so, 
you know, those are some of the things I've just been exploring, but, um, it's really just like, I think with web three, it's really hard because I think one of my biggest criticisms of it is that like, it's best to try to think of use cases first, like, you know, what do people need and to really try to build technology around that. Um, it's really not really that great when you're like, oh, here's a technology, let's try to force some use cases out of it. Right. And so, um, you know, I think web three kind of gets that a lot of times where we're introducing a lot of new technologies, but we haven't really found like perfect kind of use case fits for it. And so it's really hard for people to, who are outside of that space to really understand why this is important. But, um, I think for me, it was like, I've been thinking about like, what, you know, what would it take to make like a website feel physical, you know? And I just hadn't considered that ownership is like a big part. It's like, it's very obvious in retrospect. I think like ownership as like a conversation gets like a bad rap because I think, you know, there's just this really shift to capital that I think is uncomfortable for a lot of people, but it's true. It's just like, you know, part of like me holding a book in my hand, it's valuable, but it's also because it exists in my house. Like yeah. this is a thing I have. And so, you know, as we create just like kind of mechanisms and infrastructures to kind of just think of digital objects that way, I think they're going to feel like actual objects, um, you know, over time. And so I'm just really excited in general about where this is, you know, potentially going. Yeah, totally. I think you, like you said, you're going ahead of yourself. I, it, it sounds like you're really thinking about, um, thinking about Web3, thinking about the space. And I'm really glad that, you know, we have you on here to, to even sort of spark this conversation and to get others even thinking. And also you, you, you talked a bit about your, your interest or passion for typography. And I had watched some of your videos and I was super impressed because it was, it was like a mixture of history and like I learned so much about LA from watching that and uh, very educative. And so that also got me thinking about visual languages and symbolism and yeah. culture. So I have like a few questions, you know, connected to that. And uh, my first one would be like, how do the rela relationships between various forms of media shape? the creation of new ways to communicate? Like how do we navigate the uh, the uncharted territories between the verbal, visual, the unknown and the known? And then how does Web3 shape the interplay between various forms of expression? And what opportunities does it present for the creation of new sophisticated languages? Yeah, I think a lot about like artistic mediums a lot. And I think a lot about just like media and like what kind of format even do you kind of present a work of art? Um, and I think my curiosity for that definitely went back to grad school. I took this class um, by this wonderful, you know, media professor, Francesco Cassetti. And it was, it was in the cinema school, um, you know, oh, sorry, it was in like the cinema studies program, you know, at the schools there. And his specialty was studying film, but he was also just this really, um, really insane kind of just thinker. Um, and he just had a lot of interesting things to think about with technology. And for him, it was just like, what is, what is a medium? You know, what is that? And he just defined it as a medium is a site of experience. And it's a very simple definition. It's almost abstract. And it's also just kind of, it's almost simple. So it's so simple that in some conversations, it might be almost kind of useless in a way where it's like, you can't really do much with that. But I think also, in other conversations, it's really incredibly profound. It's like, all you need is just, you know, it is where an experience happens. And so even, you know, like can drawing exist without a surface? You know, if there's no paper and there's no canvas, I think you can, you know, it'd just be different, but you could draw in the air and somebody could see you drawing in the air. You know, there, there's still this experience kind of going on. And so, um, and another thing that you kind of also realize is that like a lot of media you know mediums are are pretty much technologies you know they're the same thing like drawing you know even when you think of drawing with a pencil on paper that is a technology it's just that it's become such a general part of your life that it just doesn't feel like technology and so i think for one it's like conversations about technology like i think in because of like social media and the discourse and i think everybody's like aversion to the tech bro kind of label we think of technology as like software as a service apps, but it, it really is a much more expansive definition. But I think what was, what was interesting for me is that like a lot of mediums, they start off with in a way that, in a way that graphic design is kind of in right now where, um, you know, you could take painting, for example, I think we've been painting, you know, in caves since, you know, definitely since prehistoric times, but 
if you think about kind of like where does modern painting begin and what does modern painting end, like, you know, a lot of people look at like Western art history. Um, and if you look at kind of painting during the Renaissance ages, it's like, was there, you know, we asked like, what is the difference between like graphic design and painting? And I disagree with this, but a lot of people are just like, you know, design has like a purpose, like you're painting with a goal. And it's like, I don't like that definition. I think, you know, I think art has a definite purpose too, but if I were to just take that definition for a second, right? If you look at painting in the middle ages, there was a client, you know, it was the Catholic church. There was a purpose. It was to spread, you know, the morality of God. Um, you know, there were industry specifics or technicals, there was licensing, you know, there were all these kind of conversations, right? But through, um, through that, like over time, that medium goes away from like an industry or a set of practices and with, you know, inherent goals into just an expressive thing where it's like, you look at painting now, it's like, it's like, there's not like one client for painting. There's not one reason why somebody would paint. It's just expression. If you look at writing, um, you know, when you think about the invention of writing and, and who controlled that, like, if you also think about just like, you know, look back in our history, like for a long time, like reading and writing was only restricted to a very privileged class. And, you know, why did you print books? It was just like the first book that was printed was the Bible. Again, it's like, there's always this kind of, it, there's always this like client at first, and there's always this kind of reason, right? And um, if you think, if you look at photography, like when photography was first invented, it was to record history. You know, it was like, you know, Civil War photographs to even like Ansel Adams recording the national parks to promote, you know, environmentalism in the United States. And then as the camera became more democratized and ubiquitous, it stopped having those kind of restrictions and became an expressive medium. And I, and I think in a way that's where graphic design is going. You know, right now when you look at design or, you know, there's a lot of definitions on what good design is. And a lot of it has to do with solving a problem. You know, a lot of it has conversations about being a client, but I think, you know, we're slowly graphic design and typography is slowly just going to move towards something like painting or photography where, you know, there, you, there might be a commission, there might be a use case for it. There might be a purpose for it, but you know, people are just going to do it because it's fun and because it gives them meaning and because it's for them asking an important question. And I think about like, how, how did painting, you know, for example, how did painting transition from like, you know, this really kind of strict kind of like industry specific practice to something more of an expressive medium? Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons, but a big reason was like the camera came along, you know, before it was like painting was really the only way to record you know, an image for historical sake. Right. And so with that, you had all these restrictions, like you should be historically accurate or you should tell the, like be an end goal. It's like, you know, if you're painting a King, it's like, you're not necessarily telling the complete truth, but you're, you know, you're, you want to rep you want to send a specific message about that King, right. You know, like through their dress and through their style and through things about it. And once the camera came along, it almost, it was just almost kind of this, you could almost imagine the same conversations, right? It's like, is this going to be the death of painting? Like, do we not need painting anymore because of like the camera? Well, in a way it's like, now that the camera has the responsibility to record history, that gives less responsibility to painting. And now painting has room just to be as expressive as it wants to be. And so, you know, I, I, I work and I, and I study a lot of kind of like AI image making and, and those kind of technologies. And I think that's where it kind of imagines where things also are kind of going to where, um, you know, as new technology comes along, it takes on some of the responsibilities of kind of older technologies, but then it also allows them to have the second hand where it's like, now that you didn't have to paint accurately anymore, I don't think it's a coincidence that the camera almost gave, you know, like abstract painting a permission to just flourish as it is, you know, it's like now it's like when you look at modern painting, it's like, you have like really kind of formalist kind of tendencies. You have like figures and subjects, but you also have like a lot of just abstract art. You know, people are just, you know, you look at like Gerhard Richter, for example, you know, or Jackson Pollock, like it's like, you can't really separate their existence away from the existence of the camera, you know, and what, you know, the responsibilities that, you know, painting relinquished as a result of that. And so I think even writing too, like, it, you know, gone are the days of like, you could only read if you were an educated elite person um gone are the days where it's like you should only write if you're going to write for a newspaper or a catholic church it's like you know i think even when i was a teen it's like i would see people just write poems on live journal and it just there's something just really kind of interesting about that where you know that like hundreds of years ago like you wouldn't really have conceived of like like an 11 year old person just writing something and people all of the world could kind of see it 
you know, and just that transfer of power and what really happens then. And so I think we're kind of really undergoing that with a lot of our artistic mediums, you know, and I, I really think that's, we're, we're almost kind of witnessing that kind of happen and unfold. It doesn't mean it's going to be great. You know, like there is also a bigger capacity to make more garbage in the world when it's, when the tools are more available. But I think, you know, to, to try to stop or to try to like kill any curiosity because of that, I don't think that's really worth it. I think, you know, the upsides and the potential for that is, a, it's a lot greater, you know, I think like, yeah, maybe now that everyone has a pretty good camera in their phones, you know, and they have a pretty good camera in their pockets, like the, has that made photography worse? I don't know. I, I think it's actually the opposite. I think it's made photography a lot richer. That's true. That's really, really great point, to be honest. Like I was, you mentioned a bit about AI and I was thinking how people are concerned about like the ethical side of that. And is that going to replace the workforce? I was very skeptical about AI and then Chad GTP changed in my mind, you know, because it's very helpful and. It's definitely complicated. You know, it's like, um, I, I could see the good and the bad, right? Like, um, yeah. it's, all, and, and I think like conversations about web three, like in AI, it's like, there's part of me that almost wishes like those things didn't happen at the same time. You know, I, I, there's part of me that wishes like maybe we had a bit of a head start to establish things because right when artists were finally getting tools to take ownership of their work, it's like now there's there's people who incorrectly think that artists are being obsolete. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's kind of like, it makes me sad that these technologies as exciting as they are almost happening at the same time because they almost kind of cancel out each other if you approach those conversations in bad faith but you know i think like in terms of it's like i think one the word replaces is just really a terrible word to go about it it's like nothing really replaces anything um and it's not really and i think it's really foolish to assume that it's going to be as good as you think it is it's just as foolish to think something's going to be as bad as you think it's going to be right it's like um it there's there's this thing that i think about a lot with that where it's like um there's two conversations that are happening. It's like, is this going to make certain art like obsolete? I think no. I think to think that like, you know, AI would kill painting. I think that's not giving painting enough of a credit. That's not giving creativity. I don't think that's giving enough credit. Will it create economic hardships? Definitely. Maybe it's a big possibility. You know, it's like something doesn't even have to replace you a hundred percent to really have an effect on your life. Like if, you know, if 10% of what you do could be done by AI now, like, is that, and if that directly translates to 10% less work, um, you know, that, that could really have complications. Yeah. But, you know, the thing is, is that like, what I also noticed is that, you know, like I look at an illustrator that feels like really skeptical about using like AI tools for image making, but you know, they might be curious about chat GPT or they might be really interested in the, the music stuff. And it, it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, you can't really pick and choose like what use case like something is for right and uh, but this is where the interesting thing is too it's like maybe a musician friend may not need to hire me um to make like album art for them anymore but maybe i don't need to hire my musician friend to help score like you know like a digital experience that i'm having like i you know it's like whereas before i needed a commission like um you know if i'm designing a video game it's like you have to commission somebody to make it right and so it's almost like these things where it's like, it's going to be pretty unpredictable, but we're going to see like illustrators, um, you know, there's going to be some illustrators that might be, you know, might have a lot less work than they're used to. Right. But then there's maybe illustrators that become like a one person video game studio because they're using AI for, you know, to help them like animate their drawings. So they're using AI to help them write scripts about the storylines. They're using AI to help, um, you know, tie all that into an experience. It's like, you might have like, it's like we might all have the capacity to be more than one thing, you know, like the musician could now be almost kind of like this, like one person kind of studio to make things. And I think like a lot of things are almost coalescing to my, my theory that I'm not the only one person that has this, but it's like, I think everything is just going to look like video game design um, in a few years where, you know, it's like, even when you think about blockchain and metaverse conversations, but it's also like, um, you know, things are going to be more interactive. Things are going to be more kind of controllable by users. You know, art forms are going to adapt. Like there's technologies like bronze where, um, they're creating like sound files that musicians make, but they react to the environment or the time of day. So, you know, we're, we're very closely to approach an age where it's like a song's not going to be like a fixed static thing. A song is going to be reactive. 
um, you know, things are all going to feel kind of like for better or worse, like video games. And there's things about that that I worry about, but there's also these really interesting things where it's like, you know, maybe I think this is, this is going to be a really interesting opportunity for people to just reconfigure like what's possible. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, I, for me, it's like, I'm, there's part of me that is scared for like the, you know, the parts of my job that, you know, other people might not need anymore. Right. But I also know that there's going to be all these new tools that are going to allow me to accomplish things that I would never have accomplished before. Because in my head, it was like, oh, my lane is graphic design. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's this interesting kind of two-way street that you consider. Where it's like, you maybe not have ownership of one lane anymore, but now this has opened up multiple different lanes for you. And so can you also create a different living standard from that? Like, can you also kind of create different careers out of that too? Um, yeah, sure. I, yeah. Out of that, you you mentioned create different careers out of that because the AI, I mean, generative AI still needs the the human ability to yeah. kind of like, you know, train it and guide it. It would take maybe, I don't know, 20 years for it to just like be able to, you know, do things by itself. So I think that in itself is, is, is a form of career because you might not have to uh do things the way maybe it was done but then you can got you are still the housing yeah. aid to train the ai to achieve stuff so. yeah it's like you know the whole point about ai it's like when people talk about it, it's that like oh one per like you know one person can now have the productivity of like five people right and i think if you take that to its logical conclusion there's something very there's something that makes me feel weird about that but at the same time i could see the benefit of it where it's like yeah like um I mean, you know, if you're hired for less, you know, you're, you also could do more at the same time. And hopefully there's something that balances that out. Um, again, it's like, I'm not saying that it's not going to be uncomfortable. It probably is going to be comfortable. And it's easy for me to say that as somebody that's built a career. But I think, you know, I have just as much to lose as as other people. But I think this is why it's really necessary to learn these technologies to really understand them. You know, if you really think that your, your livelihood is under attack, um, that's even more of a reason to understand like, you know, why people are engaging with a piece of technology. Mm -hmm. um, that's even more important to really understand it, to really understand what's kind of going on. You know, I think like with social media and like, I think generationally, sometimes the easy way to not deal with something is to not engage with it, you know, um, or to like kind of cancel it or to boycott it. And yeah. I think that's actually kind of removed a lot of opportunities and it's also kind of even perpetuated I think like the powerlessness a lot of people have and so I think for me it's just like I just try to just approach everything with kind of like an attitude of maybe maybe yes maybe no maybe it'll be better maybe it won't and and to really just kind of just see kind of where things take me and it's the, it's the one thing that's been consistent in my life that's like paid off I would say you don't kind of rule anything out you're just kind of like yeah. In, and I think that's really good. That's something I'm learning myself. I'm learning to be more open and 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 engage with with technology, as you said. So you tweeted your views on cloud bonding yesterday, and I will read it to our listeners. Um, and here it goes: cloud bonding. This is one of our decade's biggest example of narcissism of small differences. Corporate entities, USD, collecting people like Pokemon and pretending. One is more elevated than the other. And the second part is what's also difficult is a lot of these campaigns were also transparently well-intentioned attempts at more diversity and inclusion, but thousands of campaigns that say, look, mere mortal are these gods living on Mount Olympus feels neither inclusive nor, nor diverse. So Eric. I'm super curious to know your views on the intersection of cloud bombing, curation, and inclusivity. But maybe before that, could you explain or define what cloud bombing is? Because I was yeah. touching on that a bit with someone and they're like, what is that? Yeah. yeah. So cloud bombing, I think the first time I've seen it used um, was I think the day before where this artisan cultural thinker, Brad Trammell, he, he posted um, that Heaven by Mark Jacobs campaign. Um, and for those who don't know, it's like it's a recent campaign that came out. Um, and it's like really simply photographed. It's beautifully lit. Um, you know, it, it's a re it's a really beautiful image, but it's literally just a bunch of cool people. You know, just famous pe you know famous young influencers, like older kind of fashion models. There's like, you know, also peppered with random actors. Like there's Michael Imperioli from The Sopranos in there. Um, and you know, it's not really about that campaign. 
um, per se. It's like, I don't want to feel like it's, it's really a critique on the campaign. It's just really like kind of like the perfect illustration of things that have been going on for much longer than that campaign has in the last decade. Um, you know, I think it's this idea where it's like a lot of like creative work these days, it's really just about collecting people and combining them together. Um, I made it, I made a comparison where it was like, you know, this movie from, I think around 10 years ago, it was like the expendables. Um, <laughs> And when that first movie was announced, it felt kind of ridiculous, right? Where it's like Sylvester Stallone, Jet Li, Chuck Norris, Jason Statham. Like it was every Hollywood like action actor that you had combined in a film. And, you know, a lot of those actors individually have produced really groundbreaking, compelling bodies of work. It's like, you know, like I don't want to say like it's based on like a Rotten Tomatoes score, but let's just say, but because a lot of people understand what Rotten Tomatoes is, it's maybe easier to talk about. It's like, a lot of them made a lot of those actors were in like films that did like 90 to 100 percent on rotten tomatoes right like so maybe if you combine them all you're going to get a 100 percent score on rotten tomatoes if they're all in a film obviously not it, it's a film that did really poorly right because like the this this is something where like the sum of its parts was greater than the whole <laughs> and you know i think it gets joked about a lot and it gets derided um but you kind of see that everywhere in culture it's like what like, what is what is the difference between that and Marvel's The Avengers? It's really just like, we can't just have one superhero. We just have to combine them all together, right? Um, and, you know, even though like fashion, you know, the fashion industry almost sees itself as in this higher cultural kind of literacy echelon than like Hollywood films, it's really the same strategy over and over again. And I think that's for a lot of different reasons. Um, I think one, it's like, because of like platforms like social media and whatnot, like again, the value of individual works are, have been kind of diminished and it's really more about kind of specific people. I think also just like the tendency to not want to say the the right thing or the wrong thing or have a point of view, like there's this pressure. It's like, well, let's just kind of, you know, have a bunch of different views represented in the name of diversity. Um, but, you know, you could even just trace this back to even things where it's like, you know, it feels like a mood board and I, exactly that's what it is, right? It's because like, you know, the mood board itself is a tool used by most creative agencies and companies now. Um, you know, people have like vision boards. It's really just like these like um, glorified kind of scrapbooks of different ideas that you want to put together, right? And so um, what's difficult about that is that like, it's now kind of like the easy way to go about ideas. And I don't think it's like the photographer had that idea. I don't think it's like the art director. A lot of this is really just like, I've been on the other side, like having worked at Nike and so it's like, you have all these crazy ideas for a campaign and, and the end, it just always gets turned into just a bunch of cool people looking stylish. Right. But I think it's really insidious now because like, um, a lot of conversations about social justice, um, a lot of these necessary conversations have just been co-opted by companies. Um, and this is the thing about the classic incentive problem, right? Where, um, you know, like in India, there was this famous kind of, um, town that had like these cobra infestations. And so the mayor wanted to find a way to just, um, keep like the Cobra population down. So they gave up out this calling. It's just like, you know, we'll pay you for as many Cobra heads as you can thinking that's like the perfect incentive to get people to catch Cobras and get paid for it. But then that created like breeding farms where people just bred Cobras, you know, to turn it in. Right. And so I think something similar kind of happened with these conversations about racial justice, right. About, you know, sexual justice, about, you know, class, about, you know, all these like conversations on Twitter that we have, it's just representation is really important. But then I think when you have like, uh, you know, when you have like a very narrow and overly simplified view of what representation is, um, it's very hard to just differentiate that from tokenization, which is just, again, it's just, you're kind of just collecting people. Right. And so this is, it's hard to just say there's one reason for why we're here in this point in culture. Um, you know, and this is also saying this as somebody that's been guilty of also making campaign or being a part of campaigns like that, you know, it's hard to really get out of, but it's like, there's one thing our generation has done with like web two. It's just like, you know, recommendation algorithms, social feeds, mixing and matching, you know, even this millennial tendency to define yourselves by your, your, your personality, by your interests. Like, you know, just even, you know, when we were just younger, it's like, oh, I'm quirky because I like these bands. You know, it's not like I'm quirky or interesting because of this or that. It's like, I'm quirky because it's like, we, we turn, we turn it all into consumption basically. Right. And we turn it all into voyeurism. And this is really kind of the logical conclusion of this. And I think that, you know, audiences today are much more visually literate than before. And I think people are just going to understand that. I think there's just going to be a shift uh, whether, whatever that shift is. I don't know, but 
I think like, you know, as, as like Brad's like, you know, Instagram posts about cloud bombing and the word you find started going viral. It's like, maybe this is just, you know, more of these conversations will, will also create like just a better kind of reinforcement effect where people are just going to be more, you know, more thoughtful and more considered in the, the kind of work they do. Yes, yes. And I think someone might also say, oh, well, it's it's a well-curated uh, campaign, you know, with the right. Yeah. So it's really tricky because then it like it kind of leads me to when my next question is, is like Web3 inclusive, accessible? How can we even bridge Web2 experiences and Web3 um, experiences when it comes to design to onboard the masses? And I mean, I know it's not directly connected, but I know that uh, we talk a lot about inclusivity and sometimes I, m one of my struggles, cause you said, you know, you also worked, you were, you, you've created some of these campaigns and um, you wanted to put out something really beautiful, something aspirational, right? Cause even in Web3, we have this concept of curation. So curation and design, how are we bridging that when it comes to um, the changes or like the ethos of Web3 and Web3 culture? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, um... You know, curation has a very important role in art, right? And it's not necessarily in the traditional kind of curator at a gallery sense. The thing about making art now, uh, making the, and that includes making design, is that like, you know, there's not much stopping you from making the things you want to make now in terms of tech. You know, it's it's really like a money thing or a technology thing. Um, but in terms of just making images on your computer or drawings, it's like, you know, there's all these different styles and there's all these different things you can do. Um, and so you could do it. But, you know, what is the context of it? Like, why did you, why did somebody make something look like this? And curation answers really that question and it provides that context for a lot of people where, you know, it's like in the early days of NFTs, it was like, you see, like you go on a website and, and you just see like a feed of everybody minting NFTs and they all look kind of crazy and different. And it's just, you don't really know kind of where to start. And, you know, you really need that curator to say like, you know, this is, this is the context of this work of art. This is what people have been gravitating towards. This is the importance of this for this particular movement. Um, and it, it really is like curation is this big kind of way to give context and education. But like many other practices, curation is also something that's been democratized, you know, through technology over the years where it's like, um, and I think like this is the thing where it's like there's also just a lot of bad curation. What I mean by bad curation is, a, is just like where it's just really kind of just, again, mood board collecting when people call it vibes or, you know, things like that and just really don't really dive deep, you know, when people don't credit. Um, and so I think a lot of people are used to kind of bad curation and we just see that, but it's like, it really takes like really good curation to, to make somebody like, like look at this, some, you know, look at a piece of art and experience it without any context and to really have that context given to them. And that really affects how they look at the work. Um, you know, it, it is like, it is like a dying art form in, in some ways in and of itself. But I think, you know, with curation, it's like this kind of two-way kind of street where, you know, the Web3 space is still really early and it's still a wild west and it's really kind of oppressive. It's like, I, you know, I really wanted to onboard like artists of color and more other kind of marginalized identities onto the space. But I also remember that like when I minted a collection, I was met with a bunch of angry, rabid people that were really upset that, it, you know, that the price of my NFTs that they bought weren't doubling in two weeks. And that's another thing where it's just like, okay, like, you know, you might solve diversity by onboarding more people, but you might not solve inclusion if they don't feel welcome, right? And it's like, you're dealing with a lot of people that are not, to be honest, they're not in it for the art. They're in it for speculation, right? It's like, like, I think like people critique like, like NFTs as being like these speculative vehicles. And it's like, you know, I don't think everyone sees it as that. Like, I don't think I see it myself as that. I don't buy an NFT hoping that I would make money from it. You know, it's like, I, I just buy an NFT cause I like it or I think it's cute or whatever. And, um, you know, but a lot of people do. And so this is going to be the thing that we have to solve where it's like, you know, it's not just about making, bringing people into the space about also setting them up for success. And I don't really have all the answers for that. I think it's something that we really have to solve. You know, it's something that I've been on a negative receiving end very well. Like, um, you know, like one of my biggest regrets is having a discord for my last NFT project. Like I just dread looking at it because it's just like every time it was just like kind of like a message just being like, hey, any updates on this? And it's like, no, this project, like this project's done. I, I stopped working on it a year ago. I'm working on other projects. And they're like, like, can we see the other stuff? And I'm like, no, because I don't want to show it when I'm ready. Right. And then 
it's like, yeah, it's like I made a, a, a shit ton of money off my last project. So I can understand why they're upset. You know, if they see themselves as like a shareholder, maybe I do have some responsibility to them. But at the same time, it's just like, I know if I do that, like it kind of just cancels out the whole reason why this is interesting to me in the first place. Like this is an opportunity that lets artists be more who they are. So they don't have this do a song and dance. So why do I feel pressure to do this song and dance on discord? And the answer is, is that, you know, when something is new, they might not always live up to their potential. You know, I don't think web three has lived up to its potential about, you know, for what this means for artists, because in a lot of ways it's worse than web two in a lot of current conditions where, you know, it's like, it, you know, maybe a TikTok dance is okay. You know, like maybe that's more, much more preferable than sharing a roadmap, you know, like maybe one's more authentic than the other. I don't know. But it's like, you got to give these things time to grow and you got to give like time for, I think the bad actors to just get tired and to just to leave ultimately so that, you know, better people could come in and just make that space live up to its potential for sure. I really love what you said about like onboarding people for diversity, but then not having the right tools for inclusivity. Like, yeah. That was just super and that is super, super important. And I know this is a maybe your funny next question. So what keeps you going in Web3 <laughs> after everything you said? <laughs> yeah, um, I think just like really like the, you know, it's a technology that's use cases are just growing more and more. And I'm, I'm really in it for like, I've just met a bunch of amazing people through it. And I think, like I said, it, it's like, there's a lot of positives that we're seeing about it. Like for one, the environmental question you know, I think it's pretty much settled in my book. Like, you know, Ethereum has reduced its environmental consumption by 99%, um, you know, through its shift to like proof of stake. And so that's also been great, but uh, it's also like the space is maturing and people are building like really good infrastructure. And so we're going to start seeing some new cases. Like right now it's like, you know, the space is really good for art with a capital A, which is like these big auctions or creating like glorified Pokemon cards, which is like these 10,000 profile picture collections. There's not a lot of stuff in the middle, right? And it's like, this is like an interesting thing where it's like a like a medium specificity thing like we were talking about where, you know, let's say I'm a, like a, I'm a musician and I just started making things where, um, you know, if this was 2021 and this was Zora and Foundation were the two big kind of NFT platforms and super rare, I wouldn't necessarily feel like it was the right thing for me because like, let's say, like the idea of putting a song that I wrote in my bedroom up for an auction, like even if that does well, it's like, it just doesn't feel like me. It's almost like there's a lot of people that are like, yeah, I just, I'm an illustrator. Like I make zines and I do little things. I don't want to be like framed in a gold frame and like at a Sotheby's auction, right? And it's like, I think that's kind of the same feeling, right? And then on the other hand, it's like, I also don't want to make 10,000 like talking animals. Like that doesn't feel like me. And I think we're going to start to see some interesting things in the middle. Um, you know, it's like, and this is where it's talking about where it's like, I'm interested in the idea of like what a zine can be, you know, like a collection of things can be on as an NFT where, okay, maybe I'm an illustrator. I feel weird about a single drawing going on for an auction, but I feel less weird about a book of drawings being sold. You know, it's like, if I'm a musician, it's like maybe a single song being auctioned feels weird, but maybe a mixtape, mm. you know, being sold as like a at a fixed price feels a lot more natural. And so this is kind of what I'm building on, you know, on the side with this like kind of public like thinking about like zines and what that means, like not just like visual zines, but like audio zines or or zines of writing. It's like, you know, if I'm a writer, maybe I don't want an essay on chain. That's just like, you know, it's like maybe that's putting too much like weight on it, right? But maybe a collection of essays, that feels much more familiar. And so, you know, the fact that you can make a website an NFT, it's like that introduces like interesting kind of mechanics because you can just create like a collection, you know, it's like, what if a blog were an NFT, right? You know, that had like a start date and an end date, you know, and that's almost like a, a journal in a way. So there's just like that kind of a few things missing, but I think I'm really excited about like just the new use cases that could really emerge from that. Like we're going to be seeing a lot more like, like standalone apps that are NFTs. And so that's going to really take it away from just like looking at an image or listening to a song. That's going to really take it into this like kind of new interactive space that, you know, that's something that I'd really want to explore. And that's what keeps me going right now. Um, you know, I'm also working on like this, like another NFT project with Roy Tatum. Um, and this guy to to be as I work with Roy on Monarchs, which is like my first, you know, solo kind of NFT collection or Genesis collection. Um, but we're making these like 
generative entities that are also like modular synthesizers that you can make music out of. And, you know, we're really having fun with that too. So it's just really like, like I said, it's like, it's going to be interesting to see how things almost start feeling closer and closer to video game design than actual design. And so like, we're kind of just seeing like the hints of that, like coming and I, I just really kind of want to follow that, you know, if it doesn't end up being anything, that's fine. You know, it's like, I could just go back to doing what I always do, but if it ends up being something that is compelling to more than, more than just me, then I definitely like owe it to myself to just try to follow that. Yes. Yes. And I think you're definitely, you're totally like helping with helping shape, shape the space. As you said, like it's still young and it's evolving and. This is why, you know, a new firm, we're big on having these conversations and try to make it as like accessible as possible to everyone, you know, to kind of hear what's going on and to be involved as well. This is like brilliant. And I am, I'm, I, you've made a lot of great points. Like I want to like go deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, and I'm also curious to know, like, maybe if you have any, you're so wise and I wonder if you have any advice or recommendations for like young entrepreneurs in the creative space transition mm -hmm. to Web3. It, it, yeah, like I said, it's like advice is really hard to give because it's like <laughs> in the survivorship bias in it. Um, but I would say it's like, I think in general, like what I, the approach I try to take with life is that like you can try to, you can try to wish that the steam engine was never invented or you could try to fight that your local community has the train station. Um, and what I mean by that is that like, you know, technology comes and it's always, you know, disruptive technology is always going to create some like temporary uncomfortableness. Right. But I think there's a lot of forces at play. And so like why people want to will a technology into existence and, you know, trying to wish that a technology doesn't exist, it's going to take a lot of energy, but you know, you could be spending that energy to just make sure that that technology is used fairly. And that's a very different conversation, right? Like I think with AI, it's like a lot of people don't want to engage with it that do art because, um, you know, the feelings that they have. And it's like, well, for me, it's just like, okay, what is, what is wrong with this? Right. It's like, oh, like this, this is gonna, like AI art is gonna encourage plagiarism. And it's like, okay, plagiarism already exists. Right. And we, and plagiarism is bad. It's not like it's not going to, it's not going to make plagiarism good, but like, what is the real problem here? And, you know, when you try to think about it, it's like, okay, um, the big problem is that like, you know, a lot of artists, their works are being trained by these AI data sets and these large language models without their consent. And so there's like, okay, can we address the consent part? You know, can we address the consent part and can we address like those things? And will that, you know, will that address things? I think in general, it's just like, I try to ask myself, it's like, what would it take for me to change my mind about something? You know, and if there's nothing that would take to change my mind, then okay, then I made up my mind, right? But a lot of times I realize it's like, oh, I don't like this technology. What would it take to change my mind? Well, if this thing was addressed. And so what I try to do is that it's like, I just try to see if that thing can be addressed and that's maybe where I could play a role. You know, there's, it's like when you don't like something, it's like, there's probably just, you're able to almost kind of I think if you think hard enough, you're able to literally articulate why you don't like them. And so, um, you know, I just try to, I just try to take a more kind of just problem solving kind of like attitude towards like things in general. And I think like just having that curiosity, I think training your gag reflex is, is just really useful in, in a lot of ways. And again, to me, it's like, it's not about the things you do sometimes. Like, I think even like hard work is really overrated. Um, you know, it's a lot of times it's just like, how long can you and you stick around. And with that, there is a privilege, right? There is like, you know, there's like, I think if you, if you have a lot of support, whether that's financial, emotional, et cetera, um, it's easier to stick around. So I'm not saying that's something that everybody could easily do, but I think everybody's equipped to do things that, um, that prolong how long they could stay. You know, that's, I think that's within everyone's power. There's always something you could do to keep yourself hanging around for longer. If you really have conviction somewhere, if you really want to believe in that too. And really, this is how it is. Like, it doesn't matter if somebody is like a design prodigy, if they quit when they're young, you know, like there's, it's like, I think like when I look at myself, it's like when I look at my friends, like there maybe was a point in time where like I maybe seem further along than like a lot of my friends were like at certain points in their careers. And, um, you know, for me, it's like I, for better or worse, it's like I've, I have a lot of ups and downs with my career. It's like I'm, 
you know, because of my personality and things like that, I, I make extreme bets or I have like a really extreme personality and, you know, there's, I've, I've had, have up moments that I've had down moments as well. I've also had friends that were consistent, right? Mm -hmm. And then over time, like more and more of these friends have just caught and caught up and, you know, it's like they're, a lot of them are also farther along than I have. It's just because they, you know, they kind of stuck around. So there's multiple ways to do things. You know, it's like the only measure of success you should really have is for yourself and, and where you kind of fit in and what your kind of goals are. Like, I think for me, when I did all the kind of ups and downs, it's because I was chasing things a lot. Like I kept, you know, thinking like, oh, okay, this thing was going to be a big deal. I'm going to do this, you know, instead of really just listening to my gut and just like, just being like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. There's a lot of people that, you know, I work with who didn't see success for like decades and then suddenly it's like overnight, but to other people, it just looks like it's overnight. And so I think that's just like something to keep in mind that like, you know, when you see the first single from an artist, um, that's new on the scene, that's not when they started making music. They might've been making music for 10 years until they got to that point. And you really have to just understand and internalize that for yourself. And to just say like, you are on your own time and you're on your own pace, you know, and that you don't want to like negotiate against like your joy. Mm, that's very good. Trust the process. <laughs> yeah. Don't quit, don't give up. And this was super amazing, super insightful and really love that you, you know, you shared your experience and you, you know, you made it very personable. And I think that's very, very important and that's very inspiring in itself. And so Eric, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join me today um, to chat on New Farm. And I'm quite curious to know where can our community or listeners who are interested to, you know, follow your project, yeah. more about you, where can they find you? Um, definitely like, I think I'm most active on Twitter. Like I, I have an Instagram, but to be honest, like I kind of set it on autopilot because, you know, Instagram kind of makes me like Instagram is just like a big distraction for me. So I'm not, I don't really check my DMS on there, but you know, follow me on both. I'm underscore, uh, E R I C H U, um, on both, but I'm probably going to be a lot more responsive on Twitter. Thank you so much, Eric, for being a part of today's forum. And thank you all for watching us today and for listening to us. And if you want to get more involved in our community, make sure to follow us on our social platforms. And our Twitter is newforum underscore NCO. And we're newforum.io and newlife.io. You can also join our Discord community to connect with our guests. And we will put all the links in the description below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. And yeah. I will see you in the next episode. Thank you so much, Eric. Yeah. Thank you so much, Salimi. It was nice to meet you as well.